On this channel, we've explored a myriad of mega projects, some of them righteous, others wicked. Today's subject, however, the AR-15, often dubbed America's Rifle, is all the more grey. Hailed by some as the last line of defense for freedom in an ever more authoritarian world, and decried by others as a hateful implement fit only for the mass murder of children, and the AR-15 is certainly nothing if not controversial. Today we shall be filtering facts from fiction and taking an unbiased look at the reality of the rifle, exploring its history, its popularity with both civilians and militaries, and tragically its use in mass shootings. So prior to the development of the AR-15 in 1957, firearm technology was amid a revolution. Militaries the world over had noticed that their World War II era service rifles simply didn't cut the mustard anymore, with their large full-size rifle rounds simply being overkill for the modern battlefield. The Germans had found a solution to this during the war with their STG-44, a rifle that combined a shortened round with the ability to fire in both semi-automatic and fully automatic modes, select fire, a configuration that would later become known as an assault rifle. This was simply revolutionary, combining the range and power of a rifle with the versatility of a submachine gun. Understandably, the militaries of the world looked on with envy at the STG-44, and it wasn't long until they wanted something similar for themselves. The Soviet bloc's answer was the venerable AK-47, for the British it was the EM-2, and for the Americans, well, they ended up disregarding the lessons of the STG-44 completely and adopted the M-14 in 1957, a select-fire rifle that fired the old, full-size rifle rounds, a configuration known as a battle rifle. This baffling decision was the result of a conservative faction within the American military industrial complex. Big bullets had worked since the 19th century, damn it, and they didn't need any of this new fangled nonsense. This faction used its political capital to impose its will, and thus America was shackled with the M14, a rifle that was big, heavy, and uncontrollable when firing fully automatic. Worse still, through NATO, this choice was forced on all of America's allies, with the British being forced to abandon the EM2 and adopting the FN FAL in its place, the West Germans adopting the G3, the Italians the BM59, and so on, all of these being battle rifles. Needless to say, this choice came back to bite America on the rear, with the M14 service in Vietnam being absolutely f disastrous, and that's putting it lightly. Thus, it quickly found itself on the chopping block and began to be replaced in frontline service from 1964, a mere five years after it was first adopted. And this is where the AR-15 enters the picture, which had been sat gathering dust since its creation in 1957, waiting for this exact moment. Just before we continue with today's episode, I do want to tell you about something that is becoming more essential every day, and that's online privacy and security. You see, the internet can be a pretty wild place, and protecting your online activity is an absolute must, and that's where Surfshark VPN comes in. So what's the deal? Well, Surfshark solves a problem that we all face, keeping our online activity private and secure. It's like putting on a virtual mask for your internet life. No more worrying about prying eyes, hackers, or nosy advertisers. Surfshark have got your back. And let's talk a little bit about practicality. Surfshark is extremely easy to use. You just click, you connect, and you're done. That's it. Your internet connection is private and secure. It is a VPN for everyone, from the tech savvy to the not tech savvy at all. Plus, ever had your location mess up your plans? Well, with Surfshark, your virtual location is wherever you wanted to be. Whether you're streaming, shopping, or working remotely, you're in control. Say adios to location-based restrictions. Say adios to the boss who's like, where are you? <laughs> I'm definitely not on the beach. Look at my IP. I'm in New York. <laughs> I'm doing the work from where I'm supposed to. With over 3,200 servers in 100 countries, GPS spoofing on Android, and a kill switch for ultimate protection, Surfshark has got it all. Plus, they don't collect your data. Their servers are 100% RAM only, ensuring your privacy. So make your internet experience safe, private, and limitless with Surfshark. And here's the deal of the day. Use my promo code MEGA at surfshark.deal slash MEGA for six additional months for free. That's a lot of savings. So, 
Get started with Surfshark today, there's a link below, and now back to it. It was the brainchild of Eugene Stoner, a trailblazing, self-taught firearms designer in the employ of the Armalite Corporation. Armalite being where the AR in AR-15 comes from, it doesn't stand for assault rifle. He was a man whose work was driven by two principles, efficiency and sophistication. And thus, when it came to designing the AR-15, he envisioned a rifle that combined cutting-edge design cues with simple manufacturing techniques. Fortunately, he already had a head start in getting to work, as in 1956 he had designed the AR-10, a battle rifle he had hoped would win the M14 contract. Characterized by utilization of lightweight aluminium and phenolic composite to reduce weight, and by a distinctive direct impingement gas system which forwent a traditional piston in favor of directing propellant gas backward directly into the bolt carrier, thus reducing parts and further lightening the weapon, it was exemplary of Stoner's principles of efficient sophistication. But despite its merits and low because of some bribery and other funny business, the AR-10 had been a commercial flop, failing to be selected for the M14 contract and selling barely 10,000 units to a handful of militaries. But now, thanks to it, with Stoner eager to set about making a rifle chambered in the intermediate 5.56 by 45 mm cartridge, he found himself with a hell of a head start. Knowing this, if you look at the AR-10 and AR-15 side by side and see how alike they are, you may be tempted to assume that Stoner simply shrunk his earlier work when making the AR-15, and well, you'd be absolutely right. The AR-15 retains the direct impingement gas system and heavy use of aluminium and phenolic composites as originally designed for the AR-10. Furthermore, the AR-15 also retained the same charging handle, magazine release, safety selector, carry handle, rear sight aperture, pistol grip, and select fire configuration of the the AR-10. It really was just a shrunken down version. The finished AR-15 was truly a thing to behold. All of Eugene Stoner's principles coming together in just the right way to create the very rifle that the world seemed to be clamoring for. All that was left to do now was announce it to the world and wait for the orders to come flowing in. And unfortunately that didn't happen because what he had actually made was the rifle that the world would need later because if you recall the american military adopted the m14 in the same year that the ar-15 was finished and its replacement was seven long years away in the meantime armalite had bills to pay on the ar-15 having sold just a handful of units to private citizens and the old police force wasn't earning them any money and so in what has to be one of the worst business decisions in all of history they sold the rights to colt in 1959. Colts, aware of the absolute gold mine that they had just acquired, wasted no time in tinkering with the AR-15's design to optimize its saleability, with the main modification being relocating the charging handle from underneath the carry handle, a location they deemed clumsy and unergonomic, to the rear of the receiver. And then it was marketed to the world. Now, to say Colt's advertising drive went well would be a little bit of an understatement. Their first sale came in September 1959, when Malaya purchased 4,000 examples for its military, with orders from Panama and Sudan soon following. But orders like this, while being the stuff that Armalite could have only dreamt of, were but drops in the ocean of the AR-15's full potential, which would come five years later when the M14 got the axe and the AR-15 was chosen to replace it. But the road to that deal was a long and hard one, with much machinating and schmoozing done on the part of Colt to make sure that they secured it. They had their first taste of success in July 1960, when, following a stirring demonstration, they managed to win the favor of General Curtis LeMay, Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. He ordered 8,500 units in order to conduct his own extensive testing, pitting it against the M14 in a number of trials that showed that, courtesy of its smaller caliber cartridge, it was actually controllable when firing fully automatic, and courtesy of this, the AR-15 had won its first valuable ally in the U.S. military. LeMay was promoted to Chief of Staff of the Air Force in June 1961, and he immediately used his newfound position to begin further fighting the AR-15's corner, requesting another 80,000 to be purchased with a view to slowly rolling it out to the troops for extended combat trials in Vietnam. Unfortunately, he found significant resistance from General Maxwell Taylor, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and President John F. Kennedy, both of whom were concerned about the logistical issues of supplying two different rifle calibers in the field. Meanwhile, as this high-level chest beating ensued, the AR-15 quietly made its combat debut in October 1961, with the U.S. Army Special Forces procuring a thousand of them and sending them straight to Vietnam, where they were taken aback by the AR-15's careful balance of firepower and controllability, thus winning it another valuable ally. 
But the man who held the ultimate power to replace the M14 with the AR-15, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, found himself torn on the matter. With differing opinions coming at him from all angles, he arranged a comprehensive side-by-side -side test of the M14, AR-15, and AK-47. Unfortunately, Colt shot themselves in the foot when there was no need to, attempting to rig the tests in their favor, which, when exposed, turned McNamara against them altogether. It took nearly two years for McNamara's emotions to settle, at which point, in January 1963, he finally admitted that the AR-15 was the way forward for the U.S. military and sent Colt a list of modifications to make before he was willing to accept it for military use, with the main change requested being a chrome-plated chamber that would be more resistant to corrosion. It was formally adopted in March 1964 and given a new name by the military, the M16. From here, the sky was the limit for the AR-15. As the M16, it remains the US military service rifle to this day, having gone through numerous iterations to adapt to ever-changing tactical needs and technological advancements. The first iteration was the M16A1 in 1967, which was given a forward assist to help operators push misfeeds into battery and a chrome-plated barrel. The following generations, the M16A2, A3, and A4, which were adopted in 1983, 1996, and 1997 respectively, brought forth incremental improvements in sights, barrel, and ergonomic aspects, with the major change that we need to worry about being the complete emission of fully automatic fire from the A4 onwards in favor of a three-round burst mode. The M4 shortened carbine model of the M16 was also adopted in 1994, and unlike the A4, this retained fully automatic capabilities. All in all, over 10 million M16s have been manufactured for the US military since it was adopted. The M16 has also seen incredible success overseas, with over 80 militaries having used various models of it at one point or another. Some, like the Philippines and Mexico, use American-made examples, but others, like both Koreas, manufacture their own models domestically. But ultimately, we have no idea just how many AR-15s are in circulation. Due to the eclectic nature of data collection by the US government over the years, there's no figure that they could release even if they wanted to. Further complicating this is the unreliability of think tanks when it comes to any matter gun-related. American think tanks are fiercely partisan when it comes to guns, with those which are typically pro-gun downplaying the numbers of their black freedom sticks in circulation as to not tempt further regulation, and those which are anti-gun typically overplaying the numbers of scary black baby killers in circulation to tempt further regulation. But. If we collate the few reliable estimates available, it appears that there are anywhere from roughly 20 to 30 million AR-15s in circulation in the US right now. Clearly, with numbers like these, it's easy to see why the AR-15 has been dubbed America's rifle by many. But despite the absence of concrete figures, we do have a reasonable idea of just how the AR-15 came to be so popular. First is the fact that it is very widely available. Colt's patents expired in 1977, and immediately multiple manufacturers leapt on the opportunity to produce their own, with at least 500 companies having done so over the years. Further to this is that within those 500 companies are AR-15s for every single budget. On the top end, you have models like the Daniel Defense DDM-4B7, a real Rolls-Royce of a rifle that features exceptional craftsmanship, a cold hammer-forged barrel for extra durability and accuracy, and integrated attachment technology which allows owners to easily customize their rifle while maintaining a lightweight and balanced profile. On the bottom end, you have models like the Palmetto State Armory Nitride Freedom Rifle, a much more modest thing that has none of the excesses of the former example, but at its core is a perfectly functional and dependable rifle. The latter example can be happily found for under $700, and the former blows the budget at over two grand. So it's easy to see how now there's an AR-15 for every budget, and thus you can understand why it's become so popular. But wide availability is only half the story, as the AR-15's rapid success can also be explained by political Ouroboros within America. The AR-15, being so popular, has become a symbol amongst gun owners, which in turn makes it a target for anti-gun lobbyists who push for tighter regulation of the AR-15 specifically, which in turn causes a spike in sales for the rifle, either for the pragmatic reason that shooters fear they may not be able to get one soon, or as a political statement in rejection of the whims of the anti-gun lobby. This, in turn, boosts the number of AR-15s in circulation, makes it more symbolic among gun owners, and the cycle begins anew. Now, before we close this part of the video, it is worth stating specifically that civilian AR-15s are not 
assault rifles. To put it simply, civilian AR-15s are restricted to semi-automatic fire only and to various mechanical blocks in place to make the retrofitting of fully automatic capabilities all but impossible without extensive reworking of the rifle, the kind of which is significantly beyond the capabilities of the typical gun owner. Therefore, by the definitions we explained at the start of the video, definitions which are accepted across the academic world, a civilian AR-15 is not an assault rifle. Now, the AR-15 is tragically synonymous with mass shootings, as typified by a CBS News piece dated the 29th of May 2022, which decried the AR-15 as the weapon of choice for mass shooters. But is this claim actually true? And in short, well, no, not really. But first, we have to define a mass shooting, a surprisingly difficult thing to do, as every single think tank and lobby group has its own definition. For example, Mother Jones, an American nonprofit, employs a definition that necessitates at least three people, excluding the shooter, be fatally injured in a public location with the shooter's motivation being indiscriminate, thereby excluding crimes of armed robbery, gang violence, or domestic violence. Conversely, the Gun Violence Archive adopts a broad lens, defining a mass shooting as an incident in which four people are fatally or non fatally injured, excluding the shooter, without imposing restrictions on the location or the shooter's motivation. We prefer Mother Jones's definition, as the Gun Violence Archive's definition and others like it would produce a skewed and unrepresentative data set, so we shall use theirs going forward. We shall also draw from their database for our figures, as their method of data collection is incredibly agreeable, accurately plotting the nuances of a weapon type and design in a way that strongly suggests no agenda is being pushed with how they collect and model their data. For example, accurately defining assault rifle, as we have defined it in this video, not labeling from the factory AR-15s as assault rifles, but labeling AR-15s that have been modified to have fully automatic capabilities as assault rifles. If they had a pro-gun bias, we would expect to see modified AR-15s not labeled as assault rifles by attempted blag of technicality, and if they had an anti-gun bias, we would expect to see all AR-15s labeled as assault rifles in order to inflate their perceived use in criminality. Now, we apologize for the lengthy explanation of the data here, but as mass shootings are a heavily politicized issue, uh, we wish to be completely upfront about where we took our data from and why in the spirit of total transparency. By this definition then, 148 mass shootings have occurred in Americans since 1982, of which 26 have used AR-15s, AR-15 derivatives, or AR-15 ghost guns, AR-15s assembled from separately collected parts, meaning that 17.56% of total mass shootings were committed using an AR-15. But notably, given the fact that 32 mass shootings in total were committed using semi-automatic rifles, this does mean that 81.25% of all mass shootings that used a semi-automatic rifle have used an AR-15. So is this enough to make the AR-15 the mass shooter's weapon of choice? In our opinion, not really, as such a description would depend upon an AR-15 being used in over half of mass shootings. What we do think is fair, however, is to dub the AR-15 the mass shooter's go-to semi-automatic rifle, reflecting the fact that while the use of AR-15s is uncommon as a gross, they are a very high percentage of the semi-automatic rifles used. But this matter is a highly subjective one, and our take is far from final. If you would like to interpret the data differently or deem that the percentage is high enough to warrant the description posited by CBS, it's absolutely fine. Go for it. We don't wish to impose our opinion here. Just share how we came to ours to help you form your own. So, what does the future hold for the AR-15? Well, on the military front, the US shows no sign of letting it go soon. The M16A4 is still going strong as a service rifle with no hints of a replacement looming, and while the M4 is slated to be replaced soon, the XM7 that is replacing it is itself a hybrid of the AR-15 and AR-18, so it's hardly like the AR-ness is going anywhere. Further to this, it continues to expand to new horizons overseas, with the British Royal Marines recently accepting the AR-15-derived L43A1 into service as their new rifle. Similarly, amongst civilians, despite its polarized public perception, it doesn't appear as though its popularity is going to wane anytime soon. This year alone, AR-15s are projected to make up 23.4% of all firearms manufactured in the US, up from 18% in 2013 and 3.7% in 2003. So, safe to say that barring some kind of seismic and unforeseeable shift in the zeitgeists of both the military and civilian worlds, America's rifle is here to stay.